factory in China. And uh, so I use all these instruments yeah. to voice yeah. cables, basically. Oh, it's, very cool. It's become part of my business, really. I've got a original uh, 52 Tweed Deluxe bar amp, and I've got two uh, 58 Gibsonettes, which is a really cool sounding amp. Um, it's uh, single-ended parallel. It's got two uh, 6v6s in parallel, so it's parallel single-ended. It's an amazing sounding amp, and it's a sleeper, a real sleeper. Nobody knows about them, realistically. Um, I'm friends with a guy named Ben Levin, who owns Real Guitars in San Francisco. You know, from my, back from my monster days, we got to be good friends and stuff. I gave him tons of boxes of guitar cables and stuff. But anyway, um, he's owned this guitar shop for millennia, so he's owned every guitar amp on the face of the earth. He's got a Dumble Overdrive, a real one. He owned everything there is. And one day he told me, Jay, the best sounding amp I ever heard was the Tan Tolex Gibsonette. He said, that is the best amp. I've ever heard a lot. So I ran out and bought one, and he was right. The thing sounds incredible. I think it sounds better than my Tweet Deluxe. You buy them for five, six hundred bucks, you know. The most recent ones I saw on eBay were going for, one was like a 58 or 59, and the guy wanted 750 for it, and then I, he had another one that was an earlier one, it was like 52 or 53, which I'm not even convinced they made them in that year, and he wanted like 12 or 1300 for it or something like that, which I think was overpriced. Go for a lot of money, because nobody knows about them. Well, in Vintage Guitar Magazine, this month's issue, they just did a review of the successor to that amp called, a G, it's a GA8. The Gibson that I'm talking about is called a GA8. But in around 1960, they changed the name to Discoverer, and it's still a GA8. And the only difference is it went from a 10-inch speaker to a 12-inch speaker. And yeah. The only difference. Um, the review of it was lukewarm. That's something like, well, because it's single-ended, it can be spongy sounding and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, if you read between the lines, you know, you can tell it's a really good sounding amp, but it wasn't his taste. Well, a push-pull amp is going to give you more punch and more this or, you know, and less hum and blah, blah, blah. So he pointed out all the defects and kind of dwelled on that a little bit too much, I think, but he didn't really do it justice. It wasn't accurate and it wasn't, I don't think, you know, the, a review that would have come from a guy who was really, really in love with that amp. So he obviously wasn't a, a fan of that amp, but I am and others are, <laughs> you know, because it has a certain sound. That it has its own voice. It's not Fender-like at all. It's very different because it's single-ended parallel, which is very unusual. Not many amps that are single-ended parallel. And generally speaking, I don't like single-ended amps. Like, I don't like the Champ. I had a blackface Champ years ago. Hated it. Because you had to peg it all the way up to get any overdrive out of it. The overdrive wasn't that good, in my opinion. You know, it was just kind of annoying. I love them. It's heresy, I know. But, you know, that's just my opinion. You know, everybody's looking for a different sound. So, and to me, that's just not the sound I'm looking for. <laughs> but the thing I like probably most about the Gibson Ed or the Discoverer is they're very touch sensitive. Really like react to like you're playing in a way that most amps don't. Very lively, you know, sounding, which makes it just a pleasure to play. Incredible overdrive. You don't have to turn it up that loud because the damn thing's only eight or nine watts. So you don't have to turn it up that loud to get overdrive out of it. In fact, it doesn't have a great clean sound. I have to, you know, that I, I would have to agree. Not have a great clean sound, not like a Fender, you know. To choose only one amp, that would probably be it. To me, that's the sound I'm looking for. In almost every instance, you know, you can still get a clean sound out of it. And it is, you know, very distinctive. Cool amps, they really are. I highly recommend them. I've got two of them, so I don't care who knows anymore. You know? mm -hmm. um, like I said, they don't go for big money because people don't know about them. Plus, a lot of people would probably consider it underpowered. I mean, it's you know, it's an eight or nine watt amp. All you can use it for is practice or record. You know, there's still a huge demand for you know, 20 to 40 watt amps. Up, you know, because you can gig with those. You know, any plays in bands or whatever, they're going to want more power than nine watts. You know, but it's perfect for recording. It's the right amp for me in most cases. You know, although not every guitar is suitable for every amp. That's the other thing too. You know, my Telecaster sounds terrible. Well, I have three Telecasters. My my '78 Telecaster sounds awful through my Marshall. It's horrible. It's a really bad match. You know, '78. It was in here just recently, but 
it's just a stock 78 Intelligent, yeah. um, but it's an amazing one. It has an incredible neck and incredible pickups. You know, it has too much of that twangy sound through a Marshall. Through the Tweed Deluxe, it's like the voice of God. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> I mean, it sounds amazing, but not through a Marshall, you know? Marshall likes humbuckers, you know? I had a friend who had a 57 Telecast, or a 57 Strat, that mm. I played in a band with back when I lived in New Jersey, and he bought a Marshall one place. He's playing through an Ampeg VT22, which is another uh, unloved, you know, um, known amp. An um, amazing amp, incredible. And uh, it sounded amazing. Buys a Marshall, and it sounded like garbage, really. <laughs> it sounded absolutely like garbage. And the idiot, instead of getting rid of the Marshall, which is what I would have done, he got rid of the Strat and got a Les Paul. What a jerk. Yeah, that was back in the day when none of those guitars were, well, I mean, they were expensive then, you know. I remember seeing, you know, 58, 59 Les Pauls for 500 bucks, but, you know, to me that was a lot of money then, that kind of money on a guitar. What's your thoughts on pickups? I tend to leave the pickups that they come with on there unless okay, they so you, suck. Okay, you know? so you go stock with, with whatever your Pretty guitar much. comes with? Well, I've had occasions where, you know, like I have one of those Kramer aluminum, aluminum neck bases, the tuning fork, it's a B250. The Kramer pickup was garbage. It was like a cheesy 60s Japanese pickup or something. It was a piece of crap. So I replaced that with a Bill Lawrence bass pickup, which is one of the best bass pickups ever made. It's an incredible. And uh, they stopped making them probably in the 80s or something. Lawrence died, you know, they don't exist anymore. I bought around four of them because I had one in a custom-made base, you know, with the Kramer. I just said, you know, do you have any more of those pickups left? He's like, yeah, I got like around four of them. I said, I'll take all four of them. Yeah. Just right. give me them. Still have three left. <laughs> but I no, put one great. in uh, the day, I was like, that Kramer base, and I had a DePinto base that was also custom-made from the all in black. Uh, it's a hollow body, uh, um, a Belvedere base, a semi-hollow. That had these crappy Korean just junk pickups in it. Put in some TV Jones uh, Thunder Blades with those pickups. No. They're incredible. Really? Yeah, they are amazing pickups. Yeah, one of the best bass pickups I have ever heard. How would you describe them? They're warm sounding, you know, they're kind of retro, but you can get plenty of treble out of them. But they just have authority. That's where they have girth, you know. I mean, every note is just I'm have to check know, these out. amazing. It just drops like a hammer. Really, a lot of punch. It's a great bass pickup. Really. And they cut through the mix great? Oh, yeah, and big time, big time. Yeah, cause Especially the bridge pickup. A lot of times when I'm playing a bass, it sounds perfect when I'm playing it all by itself. And then the minute I start to record or put it with the guitars, it's this like... It's everybody's problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. It's it, every bass player's problem. Yeah, I think passive pickups are better for recording, much better. You know, mm -hmm. you get tone out of them that, you know, to me, the active pickups have a very sterile kind of sound, more like a hi-fi kind of sound. Exactly. And it doesn't give you the woodiness. Of, and, uh, I mean, it's great for live performance because it cuts through the mix, cut through any PA. You know, it's really a godsend for live performance. But I just, you won't get the tone out of it. You know?